Hey, Patrick. How's it going, man? Thanks for joining me here this morning. Thanks. Good to be here, James. So, hey, Patrick, for simple introductions, um, I'm really curious to learn more about what you do, your company, NerdWise, and your experience in sales. But I always like to ask people, like, what's your story? Kind of tell me the story of Patrick, and then obviously that will have a chapter of kind of what you do now in your company. But yeah, kind of who are you and how'd you get here? Sure. I mean, um, to keep it simple, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I, you could say I was a military brat and, and moved around a lot. Maybe that helped make me uh, a little bit more social and, and easier to kind of get to know people. And you could say that, you know, I'm good with relationships, made me a good networker, but I also at a young age saw what it was like to build a company and, and witnessed how that played out for other people and thought that was something I was interested in. Um, so I went to school for business, uh, looked actively for a startup to work for, and that was in 2006, 2007. So it was pretty early for startup days, but I was consciously trying to reverse engineer, uh, uh, owning my own business and, and building something on my own. Startups were just hitting the scene and it looked like a culture and an opportunity that aligned with my values, which is, you know, being authentic and kind of doing cool things and not following necessarily like the norm. And so just felt right. And um, so in 2007, I landed a job in customer service at LinkedIn. Uh, I was very oh, wow. lucky, very lucky to be there uh, at about 8 million members and the 162nd employee. And then left uh, LinkedIn a few years later and became co-founder of a company called PeopleLinks, which was an enterprise social media management tool that sat on top of LinkedIn and helped companies optimize, you know, their employees' profiles, uh, connections, activity. Um, that business had a whole venture-backed roller coaster uh, story that goes along with it. Sold it about seven years ago, and then really have taken the learnings that I've accumulated uh, in my career and built Nerdwise, which is a company that's just dedicated to helping other companies accelerate their time to market, uh, their sales, and, and lead gen efforts. Wow, what a story, man! That's a uh absolutely phenomenal especially being in the first what 162 you said 132 for linkedin that those were the early days man back before that was even a thing and then yeah, yeah, lucky. it sounds like uh it sounds like you've had a pretty interesting journey just kind of from where you started to where you're at now and i always like to ask people like why sales like I mean, sales is not something the typical high schooler raises their hand for. I want to sign up for sales, but um, I guess why sales and like Nerdwise obviously plays a huge part in sales enablement, which we're going to talk about. But ultimately, with your vast experience, how'd you end up? Uh, like, I guess why'd you pick this specific industry? Well, I you know I don't think you get much of a choice in entrepreneurship. Like all roads lead to sales. Yeah. So at some point it's coming, right? You have to learn how to, how to sell. Um, for me, it didn't happen right away. I, you know, I started in customer service that really helped me build out, um, a customer success, customer service skill set, but also got me, you know, in, in the game. And so I was able to start to learn a little bit about marketing, a little bit about product strategy, a little bit about how you execute a business like that. And then, and then it was truly when I went out on my own, starting Nerdwise, that I started to, to really get the, you know, uh, bruises and black eyes, uh, learning sales the hard way because it was it was on me now. I didn't have the network around me and the venture capital and all the resources to to backfill my weaknesses. And so, um, I think all all roads lead to sales is one answer. And then the other is this was a quote from. Uh, Kevin O'Neill, the, the last CEO of my last business, but he said, you know, if you're in a business that's making other people money, it's a good business, right? And yeah. that's always a great place to be and is, is close to kind of driving revenue for somebody or when you can have a direct, you know, tie to it. And it certainly makes it easier for us to go to market with that value proposition for us to, um, you know, win. And unfortunately, we're good at it. So, so it helps us, you know, build success stories and win new customers. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've built up a skill set around sales. It's definitely not the only, you know, it, I think you need to develop a skills mindset or a sales uh, 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 mindset skill set at some point, but you can't forget about how important the rest of the business is as well. So, um, 
yeah, I guess that's sort of what got me here. No, I think that's great. I think that's really good. I, I love that quote too. You know, if you're making other people money, you're in a good spot. I read something on Twitter, man, I wish I could quote the person, but they said, want to make a quick hundred thousand dollars, figure out how to make your client a million dollars. And I was like, yeah, that's about right. And, uh, that's the beauty, beautiful thing about sales is like, I believe we develop deep relationships because we do big business transactions with people, um, typically. And, you know, when you do that level of business or sell someone a great solution, there's just a different type of relationship there. Um, Obviously, I want to talk about sales enablement um, here today. Um, I think sales enablement is such a, it's kind of like a buzzword out there and you hear it a lot. Um, imagine whoever's listening or just for me, what is sales enablement? Like, how would you describe that? I've heard it positioned so many different ways. Yeah, it's certainly a buzz term uh, and it can mean a lot of things. Uh, uh, depending on its context. But I mean, the simplest way to think about sales enablement is what can you do to make your salespeople's days easier, to make their jobs more effective, to increase their productivity? Um, and I consider it to be everything from giving them the nice one page or PDF to the case studies, to the things that help them kind of grease the skids or, or, or accelerate their conversations and get get people further down like even the sales deck all of that kind of collateral creation would, would fall under sales enablement and then there are more sophisticated systems out there um, where you're running you know prospecting sequences for your reps where you're uh, doing market research on who are our target clients who are those decision makers and coming up with those you know uh, bulk pre-approved prospect lists so they're not doing one-on-one -on -one research and 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 kind of weaving all of that together. So you've got consistent top of funnel outreach, and then you've got, you know, your reps getting the benefit of that increased prospecting. Plus they're getting some intelligence around, you know, mark what they call marketing qualified leads. And who is, who are the top suspects from this list that I should be following up with? Who's, who's in our funnel. Um, so the, it's a big universe and, and there's a lot of things that fall into it, but I, I, I think it's everything, like I mentioned from a one pager to, you know, providing a list to executing a system on their behalf to having a source of marketing qualified leads that are somewhere, you know, in, in their uh, sequence or in the touch points where a salesperson can kind of pick up the ball at the 50 yard line and take it the rest of the way. I love that. I think that's a, a great way to kind of put a stamp on what sales enablement is. I always say like, I say a few things and maybe they're basic principles of mine or beliefs, I should say, in sales, like time kills deals, money's in the follow up. And I always say, like, you know, talk to your prospects about how you can keep the ball moving down the field. And if you can help your reps pick up that ball at the 50 yard line, well, then you've just cut out half their work, um, which will hopefully um, lead them to, um, a better result, right? Which is, is more deals done through the door. I think that's really well said. Um, talk to me what you think like sales enablement, like currently should look like, and maybe moving forward as we approach the end of the year here, um, which is a trip to say, but what do, what should sales, like, what does sales enablement look like right now? And like, what do you think the future of it moving into 22 is? Well, so it, it should look different for every business. And now some businesses are going to have similar practices going on. But if you're a professional services company selling IT consulting, um, that your, your, your sales enablement should look a little bit different than like a SaaS company selling accounting software. Um, again, I think it's, it, it's about maybe two things. So for, for both categories or for any category, you should be looking to remove friction from the buying process and you know look at that customer journey and where does it start and what do they need you know i've heard i heard this quote over the last week long copy sells hmm. and so if you're if you're actually selling something that is a high high consideration purchase you know then sales enablement should have high consideration copy materials things that on the from the website to the you know to the deck to the one pager that help people make a really informed decision um, but you need to look at all of those steps and see where you can remove friction. And then the second thing would be where you can increase productivity. Um, and so I'd look at those as the main, the main areas. And, you know, you can ask your sales reps, you can listen in on calls. You can do something called a wind touch analysis and see, 
of the last 10, 20 customers we've won, what were those touches and, and, and what was, where was their friction and, and where, what could we put, you know, in place that would help uh, speed that along. But I think those are the two levers of, of what it should look like is removing friction, kind of smoothing out the, the, the buying process to, you know, decrease time to close. Uh, and then, and then where you can increase productivity. So if there are you know, certain activities um, or, you know, routines, kind of rat wheel, same same thing that your, your sales reps have to spend half their week doing one-on-one -on -one research, one-on-one -on -one outreach, uh, or, you know, instead of doing 10 demos a week, they can funnel in and do, you know, three demos at 2 p.m., three days a week or something, sure. finding ways that you can help oh, them be more productive and and uh, score more more goals um, is kind of the general the general idea. And so that's what it looks like today. I think in the future, that's going to continue to, to go forward, right? Um, it, 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 it's uh, the, the tool stack for, for sales enablement is like exploding. I think the uh, awareness, the education is starting to make its way into other industries, not just like tech and in, in areas where it's a little bit, it's been around for a while. So sure. I just think it's kind of getting out further and, and maturing and, and uh, it's, you know, I think, it, and, and it, I would actually say the biggest trend is seeing it continue from lead gen to sales into customer success hmm. because people kind of forget about sales enablement for customers, but that's just as important as it is, you know, pre-sale. So what, what happens from sales to onboarding to success that is also driving sales enablement for those customers. So they know what else they can purchase, where else you could create value, um, you know, giving your team those resources and, 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 and removing the friction from, uh, the, the customer's, you know, uh, life cycle. I think that's, man, I think that's wonderful. I actually wrote down, uh, like the wind touch analysis. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, recently we just did with clients kind of, we didn't call it this, um, like almost like a lose touch analysis. We looked at like all proposals that they had lost and where we thought, um, maybe the deal lost momentum, where things went bad, were we out of budget, was it unqualified lead to start with, whatever. So doing it reverse wind touch is interesting. Um, man, I, I really like what you said about the customer kind of success side of things. Once the sale happens, how are we enabling our salespeople to be successful with that relationship? Um, talk to me about how kind of nerd wise like plays a part in this. Obviously you guys are a sales enablement company. Like what do you guys kind of manage and do start to finish? Uh, I mean, there, there's two ways to think about us. We've got a software platform and we have services. So we, we service everything around your marketing automation system for your sales team. So whether that be uh, developing your go-to-market plan, so it fits into a, a, a repeatable, scalable prospecting system, to helping you refine your sales outreach messaging, to generating high quality prospect lists. Usually clients are, it's not that they need more software, they need something in their system to work better first. Um, and, and then where we really play from a services and, and software standpoint is around productivity and, and trying to make sure that sales reps are, it's, it's so cheesy to say, but literally working smarter, not harder. Sure. And, and so a lot of those rat wheel activities, the things that are the tasks, the daily tasks that they don't want to be doing anyway, we try to augment that with, the, with, with a, a, a well operating you know, marketing automation system in place. And then we provide a dashboard. Uh, we're also developing a mobile app that does task management against your top marketing qualified leads. Like so that. rather than a salesperson having to work from a spreadsheet or from an email alert that says, hey, James Harper did this and did this, which they'll maybe they'll touch and then maybe they'll come back to or maybe they won't, you know, who knows. This kind of our, our platform gamifies that, that activity so that if there's someone showing interest, we're suggesting that you follow through on them and giving you some uh, kind of one click next steps to make that follow through happen and ensuring that doesn't just slip through the cracks. And, and so uh, we track how many we reached out to, how many are showing engagement, how many you should follow through on, and then you know just create that workflow for reps so that they're as productive as they can be. Man, I love that. I think that's the work smarter, 
versus harder thing might sound cliche, but in the sales world, it is so, so true. Just like trying to find like a, a correct prospect's email sometimes can be 15, 20, 30 minutes worth of work. And that's just to send one email, right? And you're hoping you're going to get some sort of engagement response or movement there. Talk to me about, you had mentioned something a few minutes ago uh, about how sales enablement is kind of expanding outside of tech. Um, you know, we work with like a ton of like janitorial high-end commercial cleaning companies. Talk to me like how like a service-based business, maybe like a, a really well put together, but smaller two, three person team and like a cleaning company, or let's say an HVAC um, could use a platform like NerdWise. So I, I, I love the, I love the question because I also think not just on a sales enablement side, but on a customer success sales enablement side where we were just talking about that, I, there's room, there's room for both. And sometimes, you know, one is more obvious than, than the other, but we've talked about a lot about what happens on kind of front end pre-sales sales enablement, right? And everyone knows about sequences and lists and outreach and working marketing qualified leads. But, and, and I'll get to your specific example as well, but I, I use this uh, uh, example with a friend of mine. He's talking about how customer success is blowing up and how now companies are investing in all these processes like sales enablement. And I said, look, you could look at any business that, you know, of course this stuff's happening in tech, but go to any business. And we chose automotive and said, you know, picture what if BMW invested in not just customer success, but sales enablement of existing customers. Like what would that look like? So what that would look like if I bought a, a brand new BMW and it starts to get to be winter, I'm going to get a BMW jacket in the mail, right? I'm going to get a uh, check-in when my cars hit a certain mileage. So, or I'm going to get a, Hey, do you want, you know, different tires for the winter? I'm going to start to get more proactive. Hey, we'd like to come detail your BMW. It's been a year since you bought it. We're sure it's time. And I'd be throwing services at them uh, all the way through when their financing gets to a point that I, it's now time that if they can get a new BMW at a better rate and trade theirs in and it makes fi good financial sense in some way or shape or form on paper. But just staying in front of your customer in a way that is going to one, generate more love, more referrals, more word of mouth, and probably make them come back and buy another sure. BMW for what could total maybe a thousand dollars worth of worth of value. So, you know, if you're hired as a, a commercial cleaning company, that might be the first thing that you do is start coming up with how do we how do we really nurture and bring our customer network to life and and make sure that they're seeing the 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 success that we're creating and the and and creating that love. Um, and then from that, you know, of course, we can talk about all the stuff you could do pre-sales to get more customers like that. I think there's a there's more of a playbook for that. But I think you really need both if you're trying to, you know, build build your business from a foundational standpoint. Um, and and when I think about sales enablement, I don't think you can I don't think you should have one without the other these days. You should have sure. a, a whole investment around what do we what are we doing to enable our customers to be successful, to love us, to drive referrals, to be that reference for that next customer. And, and there's a whole cycle there where they, where those two worlds connect. And so I'd look at the, I'd look at the full cycle, whether it's a cleaning company, selling cars, used cars, new cars, or, you know, services. Um, you know, you can't, you can't do enough. Again, to look at a thousand dollars on a $20,000, $40,000 contract. And it's, uh, it's really nothing in the long run for the value of, of that relationship. Man, that's, that's really, that's really well put. Um, and now my brain's going off thinking like, man, we probably need to be better with our sales enablement and our customer and ena uh, success enablement, man. That's absolutely true. Um, I always like to say too, I heard like one of my old sales managers from back in the day, like the best sales team is just happy customers <laughs> and they're going to talk about you. It doesn't matter like how great your sales squad is. If, if you have happy clients that are talking about you, that will do more for you in the long run. Um, the problem with that, especially in the service-based business world, let's say janitorial, people rely on that too much. Um, but I think, you know, mix the two together, diversify your process. Um, man, this is some really good stuff here, Patrick. Um, a few last questions for you. I got two last questions for you. Um, the, the first question would be, to uh, a young sales professional, up and coming, doesn't matter the industry, just from someone with your type of experience, 
what type of um, knowledge or wisdom could you give like a, a young sales pro just entering out? Um, like what would you tell your, your 21 year old self just venturing into sales? Hire a coach. <laughs> that would be okay. the first thing. I wish I hired a coach so much sooner in my sales career. Um, a lot of the, there's, so there's lots of coaches out there, right? A lot of them will meet with you for free as like a assessment, talk to you about where you're at, give you some tips. I think if you're really young and you're you're just hungry, you know, maybe try to intern for one or see if that you can join some of their uh, current training sessions, watch sales coaching videos. There's so much knowledge out there that just like any other category uh, or profession that is, you know, tried and true. And it, it, it and there's fundamentals that, you know, I can't pack into like two, two seconds uh, of, of advice. Sure. But I do think hiring a coach is something I wish I did earlier in my career. I had one one sales coach for one month transform my whole life, uh, yeah. and 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 the the one of the big lessons was just to focus on the customer. I mean, everyone knows yeah. that it's cheesy, but you gotta you know it's if someone steps just to use the car example. If someone steps on a car lot, they're interested in buying a car. It's it's not your job to go and tell them, you know, about your favorite car and why your why your car lot's the best. It's your job to figure out why what kind of car are they looking for. Why did time. they come there in the first place? Is it because they got in an accident and needed a new one? They loved something they had and they want to replace it. They just got a promotion. They want to upgrade and feel fancy in their new, you know, whatever. You just have to ask. And if you ask, they'll tell you, right? We're not talking in sales. We're not talking to strangers. If we're having a sales conversation, we're talking to people who have an interest in something we offer. So it's our job to figure out what that interest is and then meet them where where they want to be met. And then we can walk them around the car lot and show them the one that fits what they're looking for. But that's, that, that was huge for me is figuring out that it wasn't what I was selling. It's about meeting them where they want to be buying and then taking them through the process. Sure. And then you hired a sales coach for a month changes your life. I, I've never heard that advice on the show. Um, but I totally agree with you. I hired a sales coach for three months, changed my life. And I, I, as faith would have it, I like to say he increased my sales so much. I convinced him to be our, our VP of sales. So, um, I actually was fortunate enough to like convince the guy I hired as a sales coach to kind of join our team. And you're right, man. It was, uh, still to this day, such a great investment and it's something I need to do more of, frankly. Um, great advice. All right. This last question, man, it's my, probably my favorite part of the show. Um, I have two boxes here. Um, they're random questions. I don't know what's inside of these. Uh, pick the black box or the white box, and we're going to hit you with a random question. Black box. Okay. <laughs> black box it is. Let's see. And, man, these questions range all over the place, so I really don't know what they are. Uh, oh, my gosh. This is, this, is, this is a tough one. Are you ready for this, Patrick? Hit me with it. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Uh, I would say my, my soft skills, I'm, I, I, they're great with customers and, and, and actually it's kind of like, they're good in some context, but you know, I've, I, I've, I've witnessed great leaders and great managers in my career and I'm not one of them, you know, I, cause the great ones are, they're, they're world-class. They inspire people. I'm not saying I don't have a positive impact on my team or the people around me, but I just know that if there's one thing that it would be the thing I despise the most where I need the most help, it's like getting out of the tactical uh, stuff and trying to focus more on how I'm empowering the team, the people around me to be successful. And that's, I think, a, a stage of entrepreneurship that I'm just like, you know, you, you, go, you hit certain ceilings at different levels. Sure. Um, and that's one that I'm learning as, as our team has grown quite a bit. I'm, you know, I, I run into it all the time. I'm like, man, I just wish, I wish I could spend more time with my team and spend more time working with them on stuff and developing people and having those soft skills to do that. But it's, um, it's just not something that it's not a muscle that I've, I've built. Uh, so I, I'm working to develop that one constantly. Um, and also, you know, finding the right people around me. Luckily, my co-founder is like, you know, just, he's kind of like the guy in the locker room who's like pumping everybody yeah. up. So I do, I do ha surround myself with good folks who, who, uh, who help with that, but that would be one. <laughs> Man, you, I, I love how like, just like straight to the point and honest you were about it. That tells me, you know, who you are, which is actually a good sign of a leader, man. Leaders are learners. Um, dude, Patrick, this was amazing, man. I think everyone listening 
um, is probably thinking right now how they can implement a better sales enablement program for their business, no matter what that is. Where can people learn more about you, learn more about NerdWise? And uh, yeah, definitely recommend following Patrick, but where can we find you? At NerdWise.com, Patrick Baines on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, you can get a hold of me at either place. Awesome. We'll go ahead and link all of that in the show notes as well. Patrick, thank you so much, sir. And would love to have you back on another time. Thanks, James.